Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining me. Let me start by thanking the Fabanius Institute specifically and also Richard for giving me this opportunity to present my research. The presentation that I will be giving today is a condensed version of the research I conducted for my PhD from 2014 through to 2019. Over the course of, the, of that five year period, I conducted two types of fieldwork in my engagement with, uh, with Elizabeth Goodall's copies. One that I conducted in the virtual realm from behind my laptop in Johannesburg using a digital archive that I photographed and compiled of the fragmentary archival materials relating to Goodall that I unearthed in the storeroom of the Zimbabwe Museum of Human Sciences. And another where I actively followed in Goodall's footsteps and indeed the footsteps of the Fabanius expedition, visiting some of the sites she explored in the landscape as well as the Queen Victoria Museum, which is now the Zimbabwe Museum of Human Sciences, where she spent many hours working, researching and producing copies of rock art. I am using this talk as an opportunity to give texture to some of my re research and provide a glimpse into the behind the scenes of what went into producing the final written component of my doctoral thesis. I have also divided my talk into two sections. The first acts as an introduction where I provide a bit of context to the project and reflect on various moments and experiences that helped me narrow down my field of inquiry where I finally focused on the case study of my research, which is Elizabeth Mansfeld, uh, later known as Goodall. First, I'm going to start by reading a short extract written by the British archeologist and explorer, James Theodore Bent in 1891, where he relayed his experience of encountering rock art in Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. Next morning, whilst we were packing for our start from Matokos, I was informed of the existence of some Bushman drawings and an overhanging rock about half a mile from our camp. I hurried thither and took some hasty sketches of them. The rock is literally covered with these drawings in colors of red, yellow, and black, which had evidently eaten into the granite so that the figures are preserved to us. They represent all sorts of wild animals, such as elephants, kudus, and apes. These are wonderfully well executed. The figures of warriors with poised spears and quivers uh, and quivers of arrows are, however, grotesque. The most curious fact about them is finding these drawings so far north, and a close examination of this district will probably bring to light many more. The people who made these drawings inhabited all this district and down into Manikaland. Specimens too are found near Fort Salisbury. Oddly enough, during our wanderings near Zimbabwe and the Sabi, we never saw any or heard of their existence. These words mark the moment when Zimbabwean rock art enters the documentary realm for the first time. As this quote from Bent illustrates, the paintings and engravings scattered on rock formations across the landscape compelled many European settlers and explorers who happened upon them to record them in some way, often descriptively in text or through a visual engagement. As has been documented in both literature and popular media, the figurative and naturalistic expressions of these marks, especially those of the finer painted variety, have for centuries held the attention of European explorers and researchers in the region. Questions regarding the identity of the artist, the time frame in which art, the art would have been produced, and the meanings behind the images, as well as the aesthetic appeal of the art, have inspired and continue insp to inspire many visitors to make the journey into the landscape. In the latter part of the 19th century, researchers, explorers, travelers, and amateurs began engaging the art with the conviction of trying to answer some of these questions. Across Southern Africa, tens of thousands of painted panels and engravings have been documented. And as Anne, Sol Anne Solomon notes, the paintings are now cherished if minor part of contemporary culture. Scholars, scholars and interested people from around the world embark on journeys into the landscape, trekking to what can often be remote locales in order to visit what Chippendale and Nash refer to as pictures in place. 
Since first experiencing the paintings in the landscape, recorders have responded to the visuality of the primary rock art panels in various creative ways in order to capture the, the pictorial attributes of the markings in the landscape with, uh, with a view to creating copies that become movable objects. The creative experimentations of early researchers have resulted in an array of secondary images, ranging from watercolor copies on large canvases to line tracings made on sheets of cellophane and pencil sketches in field notebooks. Rock art recording has sometimes been carried out by trained artists, equipped with the skills, to, the skills required for picture making and processes of mimesis. Furthermore, artist painters had an affinity with the medium of paint, equipping them with insights into ways to translate the images from rock surface to canvas or paper copy. However, even with art training, the translation and imitation of original to copy is not straightforward and often required what Pippa Scottness refers to as creative exploration. The documents resulting from the endeavors of these recorders sometimes survived their makers and developed lives of their own, often ending up in archives. One such archive, collected by a team of researchers working under the auspices of the German researcher and explorer, Leo Victor Fabanius, became the archival focus of Justine Vinci's project, the Fabanius Archive in the Southern African Landscape. In 2014, as I was finishing my research report for my master's degree in history of art, specializing in contemporary art, Justine invited me to work as a PhD student on her project. The goal, as she envisioned it, was quite clear, to work from within the Fabanius archive. In this way, the archive itself became the site of in investigation in the first instance, rather than the sites or painted panels or materials out in the landscape. For this reason, the, arch the archive plays an active and central role in framing this, this research. I was very fortunate that at the start of my PhD, I had actually already planned a trip to Europe, a three month backpacking trip to Europe. Uh, so I was actually at that point able to visit the Fabanius Institute in person. And that's where um, I met uh, Richard for the first time and was actually uh, in, in a position where I could explore some of the archive. So just a little bit about the archive. It began as the African archive of the German researcher and explorer Fabanius. And today, as many of you know, it's, it's joined to the Johann Wolfgang Goethe University and is housed on the university grounds in Frankfurt. The Fabanius archive is unique in the scale of the expedition's emphasis on pictorial documentation. It is this reliance on the visual as a means of capturing, recording, documenting, and translating the original rock art panel that became the starting point for my project. In August 1928, the Fabanius expedition arrived by ship at the port of Cape Town. In preparation for this, which was his ninth expedition, Fabanius had assembled a group of artists and researchers to assist him in his endeavors. In total, the expedition consisted of nine members. Between 1928 and 1930, Fabanius and a team of his and his team of eight researchers traversed the Southern African landscape with, this, with the aim of studying and recording rock art images. Together with documenting rock art paintings and other archaeological materials, the ninth expedition collected contemporary anthropological and ethnographic information about some of the African people they met during their travels. The team visited a range of archaeological sites across what are now commonly referred to as Iron Age and later Stone Age periods, while still maintaining an important focus on rock art. During this time, the team con recorded considerably more rock art in southern Rhodesia than in any other country, visiting more than 80 locales. The team also recorded rock art in South Africa and Basutu land, which is now called uh, Lesotho. This southern African expedition produced 1,193 copies out of the total of about 85,000 copies, which are housed at the Fabanius Institute today. Fabanius frequently engaged the services, services of artists to assist him in his documentary endeavors. 
This photograph, taken of one of the artists, Joachim Lutz, in action, provides a glimpse into the making of these copies and shows the materials and equipment that these researchers carried with them to what can sometimes be quite difficult places to reach, even today in the landscape. In the following slide, uh, in the bottom right-hand corner, I've included a photograph of myself and two other researchers, Jonathan, Bar uh, jo Jonathan Waters and Rob Barrett, uh, when we visited the same site as what Lutz was painting in, in, the, previous, in the previous image. And I've included this, this photograph just to give a sense of the scale firstly of the original painting in in the space and then also and um, like the just the the exp a little bit of the experience of what it was like to actually be in that space looking up at this magnificent painting and above i've included the the a reproduction of the copy that uh, that looks was working on and this is the final version uh, and it really gives a sense of the intricacy that these artists were trying to capture, uh, not only in just the, the images themselves, but also uh, the fine detail, uh, the, the changes in color and the focus on like the rock, uh, the various paintings, the various colors and the different details of each. And it was at this point that I envisioned re revisiting the work of the Fabanius expedition through questions of creative influence in the, in the realm of uh, contemporary artistic practice in South Africa, including an examination of relationships between artists and archaeologists in forging interpretations of rock art. And here is just a, a detailed image just to give a sense of the um, the sorry, a close-up image just to give a sense of, sense of the detail that was, that was captured. So at this stage, uh, the acclaimed South African artist Walter Battis, who was renowned for his engagement with Southern African rock art, emerged as a promising case study. Battis followed in the footsteps of many early re researchers before him, visiting many of the same sites. Uh, the Walter Battis collection, which comprises primarily the results of, rock, of Battis's rock art related scholarship, uh, which he was conducting towards the 1930s and 1940s, which is now housed in the Rock Art Research Institute at the University of the Witwatersrand. The collection of materials numbered about 1,500 documents consisting of various forms of tracings, reproductions of tracings, sketches, watercolors, photographs, notebooks, and individual letters, notes, and pamphlets. My engagement with the materials in the Battis collection revealed that his rock art related work seemed to intersect at particular sites with the activities of the Fabanius expedition. I was able to explore some of these connections during a field trip in October 2014 to the Royal Natal National Park, where I joined Justine to trace the steps of the Fabanius expedition, the, uh, their visit to the site about eight years earlier or eight dec decades earlier. And the, so the documents in the Walter Battis collection, as well as a photograph published in Battis's book, The Artists of the Rocks, which is the image that you're seeing on your right hand side. Um, so, so this was his visit in the, to the Royal Natal National Park some years after the Fabanius expedition, where he too conducted research into the rock art in that area. And I've included this, so it gives a sense of Battis's camp at the Royal Natal National Park with his car in the background. And then I've also included three iterations of, uh, of a, another site that Battis, um, that Battis copied. So the first is a photograph, a later photograph taken of the site, uh, of, the, um, of the original rock panel. And then the middle image is a cellophane copy that Battis made by placing the cellophane over the original painting and then carefully copying exactly, and I think what's interesting here and what I've, why I've included it, is to see um, the lengths to which he went to copy the shading and, um, and not just, and yeah, the various details of the original and really transfer that onto the cellophane copy. And then the third image, which is the one um, up here, 
so this is what that same image, well, how that how that image went through um, and turned into and finally became a plate that was included in one of his his books for publication. Um, and I think it's quite interesting to see the different translations from original to copy. And this is just a photograph of that. I, and again, as I said at the beginning, I've included some of the photographs of us on our field trip um, or, or like whilst on whilst doing conducting field work, just to give a sense of what it was like to be out in the landscape, because I think this is quite a fundamental part of copying rock art and also following in the footsteps of what is now archival material, but um, what was actually a, a physical practice um, in, the in 1928 to 1930 for some of these researchers. And uh, so I've just included some of this just to give a bit of texture to the research we were conducting. <clears throat> In the weeks that followed my visits to the uh, Royal Natal National Park, I searched the archival materials for further points of contact uh, between the efforts of Battis and the expedition. And in 2015, a uh, history of art student Yvonne Marais was working at the Rock Art Research Institute and her position gave her preferential access to some sensitive materials. And it was at this point that she uh, unearthed a copy that Battis had made of the Zimbabwean rock art panel, Diana's Vow. Battis's tracing of Diana's Vow was produced using pencil on an A3 sheet of tracing paper. The scale of the tracing and the materials that Battis used made this particular copy stand out among the archival materials, many of which were reproductions made by paintings, uh, painting on cellophane, which I showed in the previous slide. These tracings on cellophane are highly fragile and the images painted on the shiny surface are not always immediately readable and often require a viewing surface to be placed underneath. The scale of the tracing prompted Marais to suspect that Battis's reproduction was produced by tracing from another artist's copy, rather than by copying the image directly off the rock surface itself. This assumption led me to investigate who authored the primary copy that Battis may, may, that Battis may have relied on to produce his version of the panel. It was at this point that I unearthed a copy in the Fabanius Institute's online image database of the same panel produced some years prior to Battis, to Battis's rendering, made by Joachim Lutz of the Fabanius expedition. So in this slide, you can see Battis's copy on the left and then uh, Lutz's copy on the right. The discovery of this point of intersection between Battis and the Frobenius expedition happened to coincide with the weeks leading up to my participat participation in a field trip to Great Zimbabwe in 2015. The timing was significant in that our presence in Zimbabwe inspired a small group of us to embark on a day trip to visit Diana's Val. And you can see these are some photographs that I took at the site. So following the site visit to Diana's Val, uh, following the site visit, Diana's Val became the point of interest that drove my project. And on my return to Johannesburg, I began compiling a kind of site biography to trace the visual history of Diana's Val, beginning with the moment the site enters the documentary realm through the Frobenius expedition's engagement with the paintings. In my attempts to uncover the earliest archival trace of this site, I unearthed a sliver of information Um, in the form of a comment made by the Zimbabwean rock, uh, archaeologist Cran Cook in 1979 regarding the authorship of the secondary recording. Cook believed that Miss Mansfeld, an arch artist with the Verbenius expedition of 1928, prepared the first known copy of the frieze. It has since been described and illustrated by her. So prompted by Cook's statement, I followed the archival trail and discovered that following her time on the expedition, Mansfeld relocated to southern Rhodesia, where she committed her life to researching and copying the rock art in the area. Mansfeld was also a trained artist, and she used her techni technical and visual skills as a means to study and copy the rock art she visited.
As I discovered, Cook was actually partially correct. Mansfeld did produce a copy of Diana's Vow, but it was not the first, as her copy was in fact a reproduction made from Lutz's original, and was later, along with some 374 copies, shipped to, Southern, to South Africa in 1931 and bequeathed to the South African Museum, now the Zico South African Museum, where they are still housed today. Elizabeth Amanda Margaret Mansfeld, later known as Elizabeth Goodall, came to Southern Africa for the first time in 1928 as one of the artists employed by Frobenius. Prior to meeting Frobenius, Mansfeld had trained as an artist and in 1931, about a year after the end of the expedition, Mansfeld returned to Southern Rhodesia where she pursued a life committed to the study of Southern African rock art. For more than four decades, she worked in Southern Rhodesia, later Rhodesia, under her married name, Goodall. To my knowledge, little biographical information has been recorded about Goodall, re resulting in some speculation and vagueness in relation to the events in her life, the details of her career, and the interests, influences, and motivations that inspired her devotion to study and record, to study and record the rock art. Goodall's association with the Queen Victoria Museum began in 1934 and resulted in a rich collection of painstakingly hand-painted copies of the various paintings she visited. Goodall's lifelong involvement with the Queen Victoria Museum has resulted in a collection of materials, some of which, are, which were assembled after her death, being preserved in one of the museum's storerooms. Goodall's archive is therefore entwined with the institutional archive as a whole. As a result, the copies, notes, sketches, and documents have not been organized into a distinct collection with a formal title. In 2016, Justine and I organized a research trip to Zimbabwe to visit the Goodall archive housed in the Zimbabwe Museum of Human Sciences. In the years leading up to this trip, I had visited the Fabanius Archive in Frankfurt, the Battist Museum in Somerset East, the private collection of Jack Ginsburg in Johannesburg, and the Battist collection at the Rock Art Research Institute in, at, the, at the University of the Witwatersrand. What I noticed as a result of this research and the and exploration of the various archives was the stark difference between these other archives, which are what I describe as active archives, and Goodall's archive, which in my experience of the archive appears to have received relatively little attention in the five decades since her death in 1970. And here I've just included this slide also to give a sense of what it was like to, to sort of work in the museum space. So this is one of the storerooms in the museum and to access the, the room that held um, Goodall's, uh, what I refer to as Goodall's archive, one walked through the passage between these two shelves with all the boxes and came and then turned right. And there's a small room towards the back uh, that houses, or well, that where most of her work is still housed today. So it just gives a, a sense of the, of the experience of being in the, in the, um, in the museum. During our research visit to the museum in August 2016, in our exploration of the storeroom, we found a range of materials, diaries, watercolor copies, sketches, photographs, photo albums, notes, letters, articles, and newspaper clippings. My experience of the archive suggested that there was no discernible, clear, or up-to-date cataloging system. However, in my discussions later on, according to Ancilla Namo, Previous curators at the Zimbabwe Museum of Human Sciences had in fact catalogued and re-catalogued the work over the years. When I entered the storeroom of the Zimbabwe Museum of Human Sciences, I remember feeling a sense of excitement when I noticed the labels on the shelves of one of the storage cabinets which read Field Notebooks and Goodall's Diaries. I had hoped to discover materials comparable to Battis's personal notebooks, filled with stories and sketches, which I had read in the Rock Art Research Institute storerooms. But Goodall's diaries recorded dates, meetings, and little else. 
Goodall's formal work for the museum, including large watercolor copies of rock paintings in the region, continues to display the remnants of what was presumably her original cataloging system, in which she detailed site names and accession numbers written directly on the back corner of the paintings. We located a number of these large format watercolor copies, which Goodall had spent countless hours painstakingly copying by hand in a standing cabinet towards the back of the storeroom near the window. The copies, some of which are more than two meters in, in length and in size, have been individually rolled and stacked vert vertically. Consequently, many of the copies were damaged and torn. This reflects the challenges of large format copies that are often difficult to store in archives the world over because of the specialized storage needs of such documents that ideally needs to be laid flat in drawers. In turn, what results is a bias away from the more pictorial, comprehensive copies towards selective extracts made up of isolated figures. In contrast to the copies, which display the, the remnants of order harking back to the time Goodall was researching and accessioning her work, are a range of fragmentary materials collected and placed into a box with the labels Rock Art Engravings and Goodall's Papers. From the archival materials that survive her, it seems that Goodall seldom clearly articulated the moment, the motivations behind her commitment to her scholarship. However, there are some documents that provide glimpses into the thoughts of this private person. For example, Goodall believed that the copies, the Goodall, Goodall believed that the copies were a necessity for the museum. She explained that they were necessary in order to get the whole picture gradually more complete as well as to enable those who cannot themselves make the journeys and climb around the rocks to see and study the reproductions of important paintings. Here, she demonstrates two concerns. First, making a comprehensive archive, and second, the idea of making rock art accessible through copies. Goodall's life and scholarship were intimately connected and her career at the Queen Victoria Museum and her devotion to studying and recording the rock paintings in and around the Salisbury area. She employed a variety of media ranging from colored pencils to watercolor paints on different kinds of canvases, including tracing paper and thick brown paper in order to capture and translate the images she saw on the rocks as accurate, accurately and as possible onto mobile surfaces uh, for a range of different purposes. In this slide, you can see that the evidence of her labor, some of which still survive her in the form of a substantial archive of rock art recordings was produced over four decades. And you can see that here, the work is still, well, was at the time on the wall. And uh, some of the photographs that I've seen more recently show that her work is, or was at least then, still visible. Peter Garlick suggests that the years between 1940 and 1943 were the most prolific of her career. Goodall paid careful attention to the original rock surface, taking great care to copy the paintings as she saw them, recording both cracks and exfoliation. There is even evidence of the sensitivity in her early work while she was working as Elizabeth Mansfeld for the Frobenius expedition. And this is one such example that I've just included uh, to give a sense of her early work. And even here, where she was working in, um, in colored, using colored pencils, you can see her interest not only in capturing the image uh, or the, the figure as she saw it, um, on the original rock surface, but also the exfoliation. And you can see that towards the top, uh, the top section of this, of this figure, uh, where some exfoliation, where the paint is sort of chipped off or, or come off the, the painting. And she tries to capture that even through this, uh, her use of, the, of using color pencils. And what's also interesting to note about this image is that she also pays some attention to uh, the rock surface 
And again here, using, a, using color pencil, she creates a bit of texture of the rock. So it's not just an isolated image on an empty blank surface. There's a lot of attention paid, paid to various aspects of these original paintings, which she really tried to, to capture already then um, while she was working for the Verrenius expedition. And this continued much later into her, her later work. <clears throat> Fabrenius believed that the process of producing copies by an artist's hand was essential to address the challenges involved in recording rock paintings. From his published work, published work it seems as though Fabrenius understood that there is no such thing as a perfectly accurate copy, but that different copying techniques reflect different aspects of the original. He seems to demonstrate an awareness of the sub subjective nature inherent in the act of copying and the varying strengths and weaknesses of different kinds of image making processes. However, because of the complexity of the art's materiality, he explicitly recognized the importance of the se selectivity of the artists in creating a copy, suggesting a kind of informed subjectivity required to produce an accurate copy. One can hypothesize that the members of the Fabrenius expedition worked under instruction from Fabrenius, while also having space to exercise a level of exploratory freedom. For Mansfeld, the time spent working under Fabrenius's tutelage is significant as she went on to incorporate her work and the skills she learned in these formative years into her lifelong professional practice. At first glance, the copies she made over 40 years working independently at the museum in the, in the then Salisbury do not seem to deviate enormously from the work she was doing as a member of the Fabanius expedition. Shortly after returning to southern Rhodesia in 1931, Goodall camped in the Makumbi Cave, today recorded as Mawanga uh, by the National Museum and Monuments of Zimbabwe database. For three weeks, and she camped there for three weeks to produce this copy, which I've included uh, a, a reproduction of it here. Um, in my reading of Goodall's life and scholarship, this was a seminal moment in her career, marking the beginning of her transition from secondary specialist and member of the Fabanius team to, to professional researcher working in her own right. The length of time that it took Goodall to complete this copy is not at all su surprising, given the extent and magnitude of the final work, which, as you can see, spans over nine meters. The reproduction given, gives an indication also of the collaborative and social quality of her fieldwork, an aspect that Michael Rath remembered in his tribute written after her death, where he had this to say. She was often assisted by the local tribesmen and the ease with which she secured their cooperation and the high esteem in which she was held by the tribesmen was henceforth to be a feature of all her later work in the remote tribal areas of Rhodesia. After Goodall completed the life-size reproduction of the Mukumbi panel, the copy traveled back to Frankfurt for an exhibition. The task of disentangling the various layers was then taken up by her colleague and fellow artist on the Fabanius expedition, Agnes Schultz. The collaboration between Schultz and Goodall was to provide an, in, in, an interpretation of the various layers of the paintings built up on the rock surface and a chronological account of the paintings. This evidence of scholarly interaction across continents provides an indication of Goodall's role as an independent professional uh, working in collaboration with European partners. Schultz, having remained in Frankfurt after Goodall left, had to rely entirely on Goodall's copy to construct her argument for the pamphlet that would later accompany the exhibition, where the large scale reproduction was placed on display. In Goodall's collaboration with Schultz, it seems as though she was only involved in producing a copy of the panel. However, some years later, in 1957, Goodall published an article called Styles in Rock Painting, where she combined her first-hand account of the paintings with the copies she produ produced at Mukumbi Cave to form a written analysis of the site.
Goodall began her discussion by situating her argument within the conceptual fra framework of the, of the time and attempting to bring the numerous stylistic periods of Rhodesian rock art into a classified system. She believed the paintings at Mukumbi to be a supreme example of this method of classification. She selected only one adaptation from the set of Mukumbi copy, copies she had produced over the years a monochromatic diagram reflecting all 14 layers of the painting that she had observed on the cave wall, superimposed over one another. What is interesting is that accompanying this publication is a note stating that the paper appeared in an abbreviated form, having been submitted originally with 45 illustrations. I discovered the unabridged draft in the Zimbabwe Museum of Human Sciences storeroom. The preservation of her materials has allowed me to see all of the many variations and iterations of Mukumbi and other copies, and through this process to begin to see Goodall's overlooked and marginalized work in a new light. This selection serves as one example where Goodall's work deserves to be revisited because it can often because it can offer a contribution to art history and rock art interpretation. In this example, Goodall's exploration of Mukumbi far exceeds the limited material available in the published realm, many of which do not include as many images and illustrations. And another reason uh, why this particular copy is so important is uh, in this previous slide that I showed, uh, this is a photograph taken more recently of the Mukumbi, what was then referred to as the Mukumbi cave. And you can see that there's a thick layer of soot that has sort of taken over the cave wall. So, and behind that, of course, is this magnificent, is this magnificent original rock, rock painting um, that has been covered subsequently or since then has been covered. So all that really remains is this very detailed um, recording that Goodall made. In Peter, Garlic, in Peter Garlic's assessment of her career, he described the fact that Mansfeld met and fell in love with a local policeman as the most significant result of the Fabanius expedition to Rhodesia. He recognized Goodall as one of two great authorities in rock art studies in Southern Rhodesia before 1970, alongside one of her colleagues at the time, Cran Cook. Yet he includes some personal details regarding Goodall's age and the nature of her relationship with her husband. And both of these elements create the impression that her decision to relocate from Germany to, to Rhodesia was purely a matter of the heart. So moving for love. Goodall devoted her energy to studying and recording the rock art she experienced in the Southern African landscape. A close reading of her archive suggests someone committed to the art, of, of, to the art or craft of copying. Throughout her life, it does not appear as though Goodall engaged in self-promotion and as a consequence is largely remembered, remembered and presented in the literature as a quiet person who focused her particular attention, skill and energy on recording the paintings she studied. Devoted to a certain type of accuracy, making her paintings recognizable, which also means that in some instances, her copies housed at the museum may be the only record of some of the sites. And here, uh, I've just included this slide here to give a sense of the accuracy that I mentioned. So the first, the image on the left-hand side is a photograph taken in the storeroom at the Zimbabwe Museum of Human Sciences, where we're holding open um, one of the copies that was rolled up in the standing cabinet. And the images on the right, the top image is one of, uh, is a reproduction of one of Goodall's copies. And there's a website called Zim Field Guides which promotes tourism in Zimbabwe. And they used this particular copy to find or to match this, this copy with the original site, which you can see a photograph, their photograph of the site below it. And I think it's quite nice to see, uh, even though this, the original painting is, is definitely more faded by this point, um, it is quite nice to see how closely uh, her, and to a degree accurately, her copies uh, do represent the original, or in some ways, how closely she was trying to have her copies represent the original.
In addition to this work, she also generated index cards of, a hun at, where, of 192 sites with a written description on one side of the card and drawings of the paintings on the other side. And this is visible here in a photograph taken by Anne and George Stoll uh, when they visited the Museum of Human Sciences, uh, the Zimbabwe Museum of Human Sciences a few years after I visited. Um, so you can really get a sense of what these qu cards did. Quite a simplistic drawing, but um, again, quite easily recognizable with the site. Um, and then a, a written description at the back. In subsequent years, many of the rock paintings in the immediate, immediate vicinity of Salisbury uh, were, or now Harare, were destroyed by the city's expanding infrastructure. And this inspired Cran Cook to describe these cards as a most valuable record. In 2016, in preparation for our research trip to, to Zimbabwe, Justine and I corresponded with friends and colleagues to decide which places of interest would be worth visiting. The archaeologist Edward Matenga, a former director of the, of, of the Great Zimbabwe World, World Heritage Site, suggested that we visit Elizabeth Goodall's grave site, which he remembered was at the Warren Hills Cemetery, located on the outskirts of Harare. The cemetery to the west of the city centre turned out to be close to where we were staying in Harare and easy to reach by car. To locate the gravesite, we sought the help of a cemetery employee who for a dollar went through the cemetery records in search of Goodall's name and gravesite number. The grave number led us to the older part of the cemetery grounds, referred to as the Rhodesian section. Once we found Goodall's grave, it became immediately apparent why Matenga had suggested we visit the site. And this is, uh, you can see on the right hand side, there's a photograph of her, of her head, headstone. So different from the carved or decorated marble and cement headstones surrounding it, Goodall's gravestone is of natural and refined rock. The face of the rock has not been polished or smoothed to accommodate the inscription. Instead, the inscription is carved directly into the uneven surface. It was at this point that we learned that the ashes of Leslie Goodall had been interred some years later after his death in 1974. Equally compelling was the discovery that above the inscription was a single motif borrowed from a rock art panel. The panel was first recorded by the Frobenius expedition in 1929. The site is located on what was then the boundary between two farms called the, the Springs and Fishers Farm, both indicated on this map. Today, the farm and site are known as Nyambavu. Again, I was very fortunate that Justine and I visited the site in 2016 with Rob Barrett and Jonathan Waters. Our experience at the site was quite different. Uh, the farm residents were troubled by our presence and we sense some of the hostility that continues to haunt the area. Uh, we were not permitted to stay for very long. The, the writers of the website that I mentioned earlier, Zim Field Guides, who are promoting uh, tourism in Zimbabwe, reported a similar experience at a nearby farm and have since warned visitors not to travel to the area at the present time. When the Fabanius expedition visited Nyambavu in 1929, they produced several, several recordings of the site. Fabanius in particular seems to have been drawn to this panel, having authored four of the total of five copies made. One possible explanation for his interest may have been his recognition of the formling motif. The word formling, meaning molding or shape in German, is a term that Fabanius coined to identify a particular category of motifs observed in the rock art. And you can see them in, in this. Uh, so I've got a photograph here of the very almost perfectly preserved original panel um, on the side of the, of, the, of the rock face, and then Goodall's copy at the, back, at the bottom. And the formling cluster is the, is the, are the paintings sort of towards the center of this, um, this grouping of paintings. The reason that this partic particular motif was so important to Goodall and ended up adorning her gravestone is unknown. And at this stage, it appears as though it may, in fact, stay a mystery.
So <clears throat> In 2016, when I entered the storeroom of the Zimbabwe Museum of Human Sciences and began exploring the remnants of Goodall's research and practice, what I discovered was a sleepy archive resting somewhat chaotically in various drawers, cabinets and shelves. <clears throat> in conducting this research, it was not my intention to try to awaken these materials by arguing that Goodall should be recognized for her contribution to rock art research thus forcibly adding her name to the master narrative of rock art recording and its history. My study presents a more nuanced approach, whereby I have gently stirred Goodall's archive, drawings, drawing attention to her quieter contribution made by an individual motivated not necessarily by fame and recognition, but instead by an all-consuming commitment to her chosen vocation. In the years since I began my study, my research has ignited a renewed interest in Goodall, inspiring other researchers to engage with her legacy. <coughs> the afterlives of Goodall's copies, as they remain for now on display in the Zimbabwe Museum of Human Sciences, are interesting to compare with, for example, one of the copies painted by her colleague on the Frobenius expedition, Shaquem Lutz. Lutz's large format copy of the Matoko frieze and his copy made from a selection of paintings at the Mukumbi cave can be seen here for an, uh, from an exhibition in Paris in 2019. This photograph speaks volumes about the global aesthetic circuit that the Fabanius expedition's materials now inhabit and that perhaps in the imminent future Goodall's copies will once again participate in. Thank you. <clears throat>